Good afternoon. Dr. David Rooney is an award-winning writer and curator. He was most recently Keeper of Technologies and Engineering at the Science Museum London and formerly Curator of Timekeeping at the Royal Observatory Greenwich. Specializing in the history of time, cities, technology, and engineering, David was lead curator of the Science Museum award-winning mathematics, the Winton Gallery, designed by Zaha Hadid Architects, as well as its critically acclaimed exhibition codebreaker, Alan Turing's Life and Legacy. He is a trustee of three UK horological charities, chair of the Electrical Horology Group, and sits on the management committee of the Clockmakers Museum, the oldest clock and watch museum in the world. Please join me in welcoming to Chaos, David Rooney. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that kind introduction, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. Um, what I'd like to talk about in this afternoon session is a question, which is a very easy question to ask. What time is it? And today, the answer to that question seems very straightforward as well. We, we can find the time very easily. We can look at our cell phones or computer screens. Uh, we can listen to the radio. We might be able to um, telephone a speaking clock. But throughout history, the answer to that question, what time is it, has not been so easy to answer. Um, and so I'd like to talk about that. And I'd like to talk particularly about how time has value and how people can make livings by selling time selling the knowledge of what time it is. And I'm going to frame my discussions around um, the home of world time, if you like, the Greenwich Observatory uh, outside of London, which is the home of Greenwich Mean Time, which is the base time for all the time zones around the world. More about that in a little bit. So I'd like to talk about um, the, the Royal Observatory, and I'd like to talk about how time gets out from the Royal Observatory. Uh, on the screen now is the clock at the gate of the Royal Observatory, which was the first clock to show Greenwich Mean Time to the public. Um, but let's start by talking about why Greenwich Mean Time is what it is and is where it is. And this is the first of probably rather too many historic photographs relating to the Royal Observatory. Um, can I have a very quick show of hands to ask whether any of you have visited the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Um, thank you, a few of you. And if any of you have a chance to visit London, I would urge you to try to visit the Royal Observatory. It's a wonderful place and it's a wonderful site for history. What you see on the screen there is part of the Greenwich Meridian. The Meridian, which is the imaginary line which spans from the North Pole to the South Pole. There is an infinite number of meridians around the world and a meridian uh, is the base point for measuring time. The Greenwich Meridian is the line which passes through the time-finding telescope of the Royal Observatory. And that picture was taken outside the observatory compound, probably in the 1920s, at a time when the observatory in Greenwich was a scientific institution staffed by astronomers and the public could not get beyond the gates. So, helpfully, the park authorities in whose park the observatory sat, painted a line on the path outside the observatory so that visitors to Greenwich could see this center of time and space. And they even, as you can see, helpfully put a sign up to tell you that you had come to see the Greenwich Meridian. And clearly there, they also put um, a security guard to keep the Meridian safe, I assume. Now, the Royal Observatory has always been a target for tourists and souvenir hunters, and souvenir hunters like these, again pictured probably in the 1920s or 30s, having their photograph taken on the prime meridian of the world. And that, to this day, is what people do on the prime meridian. If you go there, have your photograph taken with one foot in the eastern hemisphere and one foot in the western hemisphere um, is what millions of people do every year. And people do come from around the world to visit the Prime Meridian. That picture was taken 
in about 2003 uh, when the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, visited uh, the Royal Observatory um, and stepped there across the meridian from the Eastern Hemisphere into the West. So it's always been easy to find the line, to find the Greenwich Meridian, but it's not so easy to find the time on that line, which is what Greenwich Mean Time is. How would you know Greenwich Mean Time accurately before the age of radio or television or, um, or telephones? And the answer to that question is historical. Before the year 1833, the only way to find Greenwich Mean Time accurately was to visit the Royal Observatory, as these visitors have done more recently. You would knock on the door and you would ask the astronomers inside to tell you the time. And they were the best timekeepers in the country, so they knew the answer. And we know that this is exactly what happened. London was the center of a watchmaking trade and a chronometer-making trade, chronometers used for maritime navigation. And those people really needed to know the time accurately. So they would send people once a week from their workshops in London up the top of a very steep hill. I worked for five years. It's a very steep hill. Um, and knock at the gates and ask, and ask the time. Even the best chronometer makers did that. Now, that was all very well. They would find the answer that they needed. But the astronomers were busy people. They were mapping the stars and they tended to work at night as well. So these interruptions during the day uh, were rather unwelcome and numerous. So the head astronomer at Greenwich, the Astronomer Royal, decided in 1833 to do something about that. Instead of those people visiting the observatory, he wanted to get the time from the observatory to them. And so he set up the world's first public time signal, which was a time ball. That's a time-lapse photograph uh, taken over about six minutes uh, of the world's first time signal, the time ball at Greenwich. It's um, a very large um, metal ball which sits on a mast, as you can see. Normally, it sits at the bottom of the mast, resting on the top of the roof. At five minutes to one, as measured by the finest telescopes and clocks in the country, though, that, ma that ball was hoisted halfway up the mast as a visual signal for anybody who could see that time ball to get ready because the time signal was about to come. At two minutes to one in the afternoon, it would be hoisted all the way to the top of the mast, and then at the instant of one o'clock, Greenwich Mean Time, uh, it would fall very quickly and reach the bottom. So if you were watching the ball, perhaps you were watching through a telescope from a ship tied up on the River Thames um, down at the bottom of the hill, you would know that it was precisely one o'clock Greenwich Mean Time. Time was very important for navigation. Lives depended on it, and so those sailors in those ships would be able to set sail from London, safe in the knowledge that they were likely to get where they wanted safely. Now, this was a remarkable piece of technology. It sounds a little bit old-fashioned, doesn't it? You'd need a telescope to look at a huge ball which drops on a mast, but it was the state of the art, um, and it was a, an astonishing and life-saving invention. Uh, as with all inventions, it didn't work all of the time. In 1855, there was a winter uh, storm um, the ball was at the top of the mast, which, as you now know, means that it was between two minutes to one and just before one o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, and the storm had some heavy wind, and it blew the ball off, and it crashed down into the courtyard. If you can read the top of that watercolor, drawn on the spot as the time ball fell on December the 6th, 1855, uh, drawn on the spot by Hubert Airy, who was the 17-year-old son of the Astronomer Royal George Airy. So it was a piece of technology that worked almost all of the time, but there were times when it didn't work. Moreover, it only worked if you could see it, of course. Now, you could see it if you were in a ship on the River Thames, but if you were working in London, maybe you were making those marine chronometers, or maybe you ran a watchmaking shop. You can't see the Royal Observatory from there. Um, we'll come back to that in a moment. As with everything else to do with time, it became of great public interest. This is a postcard from, I think, uh, the, I think about 1905, 
um, of people watching the ball rise at the Royal Observatory. What I find beautiful about that picture is the motor car uh, just at the top left of the scene, a very early motor car, and all of those people dressed up beautifully to watch this happening, the dropping of the time ball at the Royal Observatory. What I want to say here is that this, this science institution, the Royal Observatory, which was a government-sponsored science institution set up in 1675 to solve a huge problem, navigation, was a site which the public felt was of great importance. Science held great value in society. It still does, I think, but it's, a, it's different, and we have to work hard to retain the public's engagement with science, as you all know very well. Here, people visited, and what a wonderful scene that was. So, as I say, that was all very well if you could see the time ball, but what if you couldn't? Well, the Astronomer Royal who founded the time ball in 1833 had another idea, and he set up a second time service, which is going to form the basis of the, most of my talk. Um, it's going to sound quite unusual, but it was to do with this, which is an 18th century pocket watch made by the finest pocket watch maker in the world at the time, John Arnold. You can see the name Arnold on the dial there. In 1836, that pocket watch, which was already about 50 years old, was corrected every week to the precision and accuracy of a tenth of a second and was then carried around London for several days to people who had paid a subscription to receive a visit from this watch. So instead of those watchmakers having to go to Greenwich, to the, to the top of that hill, to that closed science observatory, and knock on the door and incur the potential anger of the astronomers, one of the members of staff took that watch set by the finest timekeepers at the observatory and took it around London. It seems so obvious now that time should go to the people who need it rather than the other way around, but it took until 1836 for that to start. Um, the person who took that around London was one of the observatory's staff, a man called John Belleville. And he used this watch um, set by this clock, which is still on show at the observatory, if you're interested in old clocks, which of course you all are, as you're here at the time um, program. Um, this is the clock at the observatory which set it. It was also the clock that was used to drop the time ball in this period. Now, this service, where you would pay an annual subscription for a weekly visit from that watch, was a huge success. I'll come on in a moment to how successful it was. John Belleville took that watch around London every week for 20 years until he passed away in the year 1856. He was buried near to the Royal Observatory um, in, um, in a grave next to the vault, which you can see here, which, if you're interested, also contains the remains of Edmund Halley, the second astronomer royal, whose name was given to Halley's Comet, um, which we still observe today. When John Belleville passed away in 1856, many of his customers asked his widow, Maria Belleville, if she would continue to bring that watch because time was valuable to them. Here's Maria Belleville at a customer's premises um, a few decades later in um, a graphic newspaper from 1892. Um, sh she was getting a little bit of advertising for her business. She carried the watch which I showed you around London from 1856 until 1892 when she decided to retire uh, when she had reached a great age and was by that point almost blind. So 1892, when this picture was taken, you might think that that service had, had done what it needed to do. Um, it had started in 1836. But no, when Maria Belleville decided to retire in 1892, many of her customers asked whether her daughter, Ruth, would continue to bring the same pocket watch. Here's Ruth Belleville pictured in the 1920s, and Ruth Belleville continued to carry that watch, corrected every week at the Royal Observatory to one-tenth of a second around London until the year 1940, 106 years after her father had started to carry it. So it's an astonishing service. She operated it just for 48 years before she retired. She was aged 86 by that point in the year 1940. 
So 104 years, one watch, one family, and just two generations of that family, and a lot of people were paying for that visit. Now, how many people, you might think, well, surely by 1940 it was just the tradition. Well, not a bit of it. Um, this, the, the customers numbered 200 in London when John Belleville started. They tailed off a little bit uh, as time went on, but Ruth still had 50 customers in 1940 who paid for that visit every week. People all across London, all kinds of companies, businesses, the docks, warehouses, banks, department stores, and even, according to a newspaper article, the houses of two millionaires who were visited, and some of the most fashionable shopping streets in London were able to set their watches by Greenwich Time in Bond Street, Regent Street, and Mayfair. These are all from newspaper articles from the 1920s. So there we are. There's an interesting, it feels like a, a rather trivial story about a family that took a pocket watch around London, but actually it's not. And what I'd like to talk about is technology and the role that technology plays in our lives, but also the long life that many technologies have. And the idea that when new technologies come along, they do not immediately and inevitably replace older technologies. The, the older and the new technologies coexist often for far longer than we might think, and in some cases, the older technology for some people is better than the new technology. I guess I'm saying it's easy for us to be seduced by the very latest inventions, but we should always remember that they are part of a landscape of older technologies on which they build, all of which I think is important and, as a historian, interesting to study. Okay. What did historians make of Ruth Belleville and John and Maria as time went on? Well, not a lot, really, which is why I decided to write about their work. Um, there's, a, there's a history of the Royal Observatory written in 1975, and it was pretty dismissive of this time service. Um, the historian then said that those visits were maintained more as a tradition than out of necessity. Much more accurate methods of obtaining time signals were by the 1850s readily available. So, well, there we are, that's pretty dismissive. By the 1850s, there were better methods of getting the time, and so people continued to pay the Bellevilles until 1940, purely out of tradition. Well, I don't believe that for a second. People do not pay for services unless they have value, particularly not through economic depressions like the 1920s in the UK and so on. However, let's look at this apparently better system from the 1850s. And I showed you the picture earlier. Uh, this is the first clock in the world to show precise Greenwich Mean Time to the public. It's still there. You can still set your watches by it uh, outside the gates of the Royal Observatory. And it, too, was a real tourist attraction. Uh, this is one of many postcards that I've collected over the years because this is the kind of life I live and I collect photographs of the Royal Observatory. And if, you can, if you're near the front, you might just see that there's some handwriting at the bottom which says, you can see the clock where I have marked it. And if you look to the right of the picture, you'll just see that white circle, which is the dial of the clock I just showed you. And if you're very um, close to the front, you'll see that there's a black splodge of pen. So the person who's called Jean, who wrote this postcard, indeed did mark the clock. And you can imagine how excited Jean was to share with their family uh, back home the visits to the Royal Observatory. And Jean was probably talking for weeks about the clock, this new clock that they, were, that they were going to visit, and they would tell the family all about it. And I'm sure the family was delighted to hear all about the clock for many months afterwards. It was an astonishing system, um, and I'll come back in a little bit to how the system worked. So let's just recap. Um, the Belleville Time Service, carrying that 18th century pocket watch around in a, in a handbag, um, had 200 customers. It tailed off a little bit, but 50 by the end. Um, it was viewed as a tradition by that um, historian in 1975, um, and this was the system which it's believed replaced it. Um, well, I'm not so sure. So I wondered where this idea of it being anachronistic or just a tradition uh, came from. And I think it came from a lecture made in 1908 by a man called Sinjin Wynne. 
I'm going to show you a picture of St. John Wynne's uh, signature, so you can feel closer to the man, um, who gave a lecture to a group of people called the United Wards Club. The United Wards Club were the people who ran the city of London, the square mile, the financial and trading heart of London. And he gave a lecture to them in 1908, and it talked about Ruth Belleville, who carried that watch around. She didn't know about it. She wasn't in the audience. She found out about it two days later when she was doorstepped by newspaper journalists at her little cottage um, outside of London who said that they'd been to a lecture and her service had been talked about. Um, and they said the lecture had been called The Time of a Great City, a plea for uniformity. And this is what St. John Wynne said in that lecture about time in the city. He said, it may be interesting and amusing to some of you to learn how Greenwich Mean Time was distributed amongst the clock and watch trade in London before the present arrangement came into being. He said, a woman who was possessed of a chronometer obtained permission from the Astronomer Royal of the time to call at the observatory and have the watch corrected as often as she pleased. She then made it the business of her life until she reached a great age to call upon her customers with the correct time. And on her retirement, this useful work was and today is carried on by her successor. Now, that was actually quite dismissive, again, suggesting that it was just an amusing little byway in history. Uh, well, actually, it was worse than that. He was trying to put Ruth Belleville out of business. And as um, somebody who needed that um, income to survive, this was pretty dangerous for her. It got into all of the British newspapers. All of the British national newspapers reported um, this lecture and reported on this funny person who was carrying time around London. Actually, it didn't serve the purpose that he wanted because um, Ruth Belleville later said, I think he will not attack me again in public because the result ended in a rather heated discussion at the end of his lecture and the last thing that he wanted was to advertise my chronometer at his company's expense, which was the only result he got. So in fact, when he was trying to dismiss her service as being just a tradition, an amusing little byway of history. In fact, he got her so much publicity that she got several more customers. So well done to her. Um, well, who was this guy? Because that's what is so very significant. Well, he was the chairman of a company called the Standard Time Company. He sold time. And what he did was he rented you a clock like this, which looks like a fairly ordinary clock, from 1908, you'd have to wind it up and it would last for a week. But if you're very close, you might just see at the top of the dial, where the number 12 is, right at the top, there's a slight circular uh, slot cut out just at the top. Now, that's got two pins projecting through. So when the minute hand comes up to nearly the hour, then it comes within those two pins. At the instant of every hour, an electrical signal would be received by this clock and hundreds of other clocks connected. And those pins would snap together for about half a second and then move apart. They would physically pull the hand of the clock exactly to the top of the hour. So if it was running a little bit slow or a little bit fast, every hour it would be set exactly right, a mechanical clock. So it was a synchronized mechanical clock from 1908. It was an astonishing piece of technology, and that's what St. John Wynne sold. He sold the time through these corrected clocks. Um, that clock is, is still on display and still working for anybody interested. And so Ruth Belleville was actually a competitor for his business. Um, she was selling time. He was selling time. Um, and in fact, the argument that he made in that lecture to try and suggest that she was providing an old-fashioned service uh, was, a, was an opportunity to put her out of business so that he could get her customers. Well, it didn't happen, as you know, because she continued working till 1940, as I told you. But um, let's look a little bit further at the competition. So I mentioned this clock already, which is outside the observatory, and that wonderful system which uh, was set up in the 1850s. Um, and it was all about electricity. So this was who the competition was. Um, for the Standard Time Company and for Ruth Belleville. This clock is not a clock. It's simply a dial, and it has a couple of magnets, electromagnets. 
uh, and a couple of wheels, and then that's it. And it's connected by electric wires uh, around the observatory, under the forecourt, around some buildings, eventually ends up at another clock. And that clock looks more like one that you would recognize. It has a pendulum, if you imagine an old grandfather clock, but more accurate. These were the clocks that astronomers used. They had a swinging pendulum, which swung once every second. Normally, though, the swinging pendulum would be attached to hands that go around the clock through gear wheels. Um, this new system installed in 1852 was entirely new and very exciting. Instead of operating a train of wheels every time the pendulum swung, it operated an electrical switch. And that switch switched a battery in and out of a circuit. So every second, as measured by this most accurate clock at Greenwich, a tiny burst of electricity would pass around an electrical network wherever you wanted to put electrical wires. If you then attached a dial like this to those electrical wires, and the dial had an electromagnet, then every second, the electromagnet could use a ratchet to push a hand round. The hand in the smaller dial that you see inset is the second's hand. So every second, that hand moves on one second. A couple of wheels cause the minute and hour hands to work. So it looks just like a clock, but behind it, it's being operated by electricity. Why does this matter? It matters for a very, very important reason. This clock would always tell exactly the same time as the time on that pendulum clock. So if that pendulum clock was the master clock for a whole country, then any clock that you connected by an electrical wire to it would tell exactly the same time. Now, the clocks that existed until then varied, right? Any clock would tell a slightly different time from the others. With this system, you could have a synchronized service where time could be standardized. You could run an electrical cable for hundreds of miles and put a dial at the other end of it, and it would tell the same time as the time in the Royal Observatory. And this system was installed in 1851. Now, in fact, it wasn't those one-second impulses of electricity that were sent around the country, because that would have tied up those electrical wires too much. Instead, time signals started to be sent every hour, twice a day, or once a day, depending on how much you wanted to pay. And all of them referred back to the clock at the Royal Observatory Greenwich, the clock which was set right by the astronomical observations of the stars by the finest astronomers in the world at that time. So this system, in theory, is wonderful. It's standard time and it's electricity, which moves at the speed of light, not like those people carrying a watch in their handbag who moved at the speed of walking pace. So it was quite wonderful. But did it always work, is the question. And the answer, as with any new high technology, is often it works, but sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes there'll be failures. And if you imagine all of those wires and electrical relays and switch boxes, and they're traveling all around the country, and there's weather, there's wind blowing lines down, and there's power failures and batteries run out. In fact, this was a rather unreliable service. And I've seen files of papers of complaint letters an inch thick at the post office who ran this service for the Royal Observatory of complaints about this service not working. Either it was inaccurate, so the, service, so the time signals it would send would be wrong by minutes or seconds. Unreliable, in other words, days would pass and you wouldn't receive your time signal. And also untrustworthy, because how would you know whether the time was right if last week it was half an hour late? or the week before it was three seconds early. For many people, fractions of a second mattered. Lives depended on it, as I mentioned. And so, in fact, the reality of this service was it was rather unreliable. So that might be one reason why people continue to take the Belleville time service with that 18th century pocket watch until the middle of the 20th century. Another reason might have been that they were very cheap and if they were much cheaper than these new electrical services, that might be a reason. In fact, the answer to that is not true. The Bellevilles charged quite a lot of money for access to their weekly visit with that watch. And in fact, you could have got the standard time companies automatically corrected clocks for about a half or a third of the price of your weekly visit from the Bellevilles. 
And so if these electrical systems were so much better, why would people pay that money? It's a lot of money uh, to get that weekly visit. Well, I think the answer is, is varied, but I think a rather important answer, which is to do with trust. And trust in science and technology is really, really important. We need always to remember that the people who are going to use our technologies or who we want to buy our technologies need to trust that they do what we say they will. And that trust is hard won. That trust takes time and effort to build up. Once it's built up, it can last for a very long time, but also it can be lost in a moment. And I think what this episode can help to tell us is that sometimes the old technologies are better than the new technologies for some people. The Belleville's pocket watch would give you the time to one-tenth of a second. The watch that they bring you and the certificate which is signed saying this has come from the Royal Observatory, from the finest timekeepers in the country. Because you know them, you know their family. And this is important. The people providing these electrical services were big companies. You, pr you received the time remotely. And you never really knew whose business it was that you were um, contracting with. And I think we need to think about these issues of trust um, quite a lot, actually, in technology. In 1940, the Belleville Time Service came to an end. And whilst I've argued that the electrical time service by wires wasn't as good as it was made out to be, by 1940, I will grudgingly concede that there were other time services available which were alternatives to the Belleville's service. The first one, which um, has been around now for over a century, is time by radio, time by um, wireless radio signals. The, this is uh, one of the um, masts at one of Britain's former biggest radio stations called Rugby Radio Station, which was built in the 1920s to send time and weather signals to ships, to British Navy ships around the world. The wireless signals, signals that this broadcast were very long wave, which meant that they didn't fire off into the atmosphere. They would follow the curvature of the Earth, which meant that the signals for time and weather could go around the Earth and reach ships on the other side of the world. Uh, and for navies, w um, which had large empires, that was, of course, very significant. Um, those very long wave radio stations are still used today, used to get signals to submarines. Um, which might need to receive instructions from land quickly. Um, this is Rugby Radio Station, which started sending the time to specialists in the UK and Western Europe, just it didn't have very much range, from the 1920s, following an earlier experiment at the Eiffel Tower in Paris in 1910 to show that you could send time very well by wireless. Um, by the early 1920s, um, something else happened which changed the value of radio time very significantly. Just before I do, I'd like to show you, because this is what I care about, a picture of the world's oldest working quartz clock. Um, if any of you come to my conversation at 2 o'clock this afternoon, I'll be talking about many things, including quartz clocks, which interest me greatly. Uh, this is the oldest working quartz clock, I believe, in the world from about 1940. And it's the type that was used to provide the time signal from rugby radio station uh, from the 1940s onwards. Forgive me for showing you these beautiful things. In 1922... The British Broadcasting Company, the BBC, was founded. Um, and it was the first chance for people to receive radio broadcasts, radio programs, as opposed to the dots and dashes of Morse code uh, signals, which was what wireless was before that. Um, in this picture, you can see the chief announcer of the BBC um, in front of a microphone uh, making a broadcast. And what you can see in the background is as you can immediately tell, a set of tubular bells tuned to the Westminster chimes, the chimes that you would hear on clocks such as Big Ben, just before the hour. The BBC, from its start, knew that one service it could provide its listeners, as well as music and entertainment, was the time. And this is how they did it for two years. The announcer here 
would wait until he could hear the sound of Big Ben from the open window of the studio in London, and he could hear Big Ben uh, through the window, and he would ring along with Big Ben on these tubular bells into the microphone where they would be broadcast to the nation. What a beautiful, beautiful experience. Um, it wasn't particularly high-tech. Now, as I've just been talking about, that shouldn't necessarily be a problem, but really this didn't work very well. You'll, as a science university, you'll immediately be thinking, what about the speed of sound? It will have taken some time for the sound to have got from Big Ben to the announcer's ears before he rang along on these tubular bells. And that meant that the time was going out on the BBC about two and a half seconds too late. They knew they had to do something about it. And after just two years, they did. And in 1924, they started broadcasting the six-pip time signal, which is still available on the BBC World Service around the world to this day, which used a clock at the Royal Observatory, again, which was set so that every um, hour, actually every 15 minutes, if the BBC wanted it, um, a little system in this clock would send six bursts of electricity up a telephone wire to the BBC, where they would be converted into audio signals or tones or pips that we could hear and then broadcast. And those familiar six pips, which herald the start of a new hour, um, if you listen to them on BBC Radio, have been going strong since 1924, and this is the clock which originally provided them. So that was a wonderful service which is still going strong today. If you listen to the World Service on, um, on the internet, it's delayed, so don't set your watches uh, by internet time. But if you can listen on a conventional wireless set, it still comes from the BBC, and it's remarkable. The time doesn't come from the Greenwich Observatory anymore, by the way. It comes from American military uh, GPS satellites. Um, we could talk about that in questions if you're interested. Um, the third system which was available in the 20th century was time by the telephone. And this came around in 1936 in the UK because the six pips were available perhaps once an hour. The um, time from the Belleville family was available perhaps once a week. What if you wanted to know the time right now? and he wanted to know it precisely. Well, since 1936 in the UK, and then subsequently in most countries around the world, you can pick up the phone, you can call a particular number, and you'll be put through to an automatic clock, which will tell you the time. In the UK, it says, at the third stroke, it will be 1, 17, and 30 seconds. Three short pips, and you can set your watch, and you'll know it's time to go for lunch, or to leave work, or whatever. Well, this is an advert for that service. Um, if you're going to build a clock that talks, you're going to need a voice for that clock. And the post office who ran the telephone service at, in the UK, who ran the speaking clock, um, decided to hold nationwide auditions to find the voice for the speaking clock, which was to be set running in 1936. The competition was only open to employees of the telephone service, but there were many thousands of those because all of the telephone exchange operators who would connect your call manually when you wanted to telephone somebody, they were the people you would ring at the exchange and say, I'd like to speak to telephone number 123. They would connect your call. Thousands of people, they all competed in months of regional heats to have their voice considered to be the voice for the speaking clock. It was to be called the girl with the golden voice. And in these regional heats, which narrowed it down to nine finalists, um, saw thousands of people. The nine finalists had to come to London to do live auditions in front of this panel of experts. Most of these were people who were in their late teens or early 1920s. How terrifying must it have been to visit uh, London, the capital of the UK, and to be speaking to this set of luminaries um, from left to right was the chief announcer of the BBC, Stuart Hibbard, um, a very well-known and um, ac actor, Dame Sybil Thorndike, the poet laureate who'd set the tests that these people would have to read. They had to read 17th century poetry by Milton. Um, then 
a, a person called Mrs. Atkinson, who was chosen as the perfect telephone subscriber. So in a parallel competition, the people who made telephone calls, who called the exchange operators, were also voted on by the exchange operators to find the perfect subscriber who was nicest to them. Mrs. Atkinson won, and she came to London. Um, and then on the right is Lord Eilif, who was representing industry. So these exchange operators had to read all kinds of poetry and time sentences into uh, a golden telephone handset. Um, this is a still from a film made at the time, uh, which I really can recommend that you watch if you're interested in this. And the finalist was selected, um, who was Ethel Kane, who was an exchange operator in Croydon, near London, actually lived very close to Ruth Belleville, although they were separated by a generation. As I was researching this story, I was looking into some of the regional finalists for the Girl with the Golden Voice competition. So I got all of the names, it's all in the archives, and I'm, from, I'm not from London, I'm from the northeast of England, a place called South Shields, and I was delighted to see that in one of the regional heats, uh, one of the finalists who came to London was from the South Shields Telephone Exchange. And I wondered why, when I was at school in South Shields, I was never taught in history that one of our local people had nearly become the most listened to voice in Britain in the 1930s. Until that is, I read the Poet Laureate's um, comments, his notes that he was taking as the um, final happened in London. He really didn't like regional accents. I have quite a strong regional accent. Um, he didn't like them at all, so he forbade them. So he wrote in the notes um, for the woman called Mary Dixon from South Shields. He said, in none of the finalists could there be found any trace of a regional accent except for one, and that was a northern one from South Shields. So that was Mary Dixon. As it turned out, as I sent a copy of the book that I wrote to my mother, she read it and said, did you know you're related to Mary Dixon? Mary Dixon used to look after my mother when my mother was a very small child. So I am genetically related to a Greenwich Time provider, which probably makes some things clear. Here is Ethel Kane reading the 79 different phrases needed to make a speaking clock uh, into the recording device. Um, uh, which then broadcast the time until the 1960s when she was replaced. So I think my time is starting to come to an end, so I'm going to start to close. So we've seen some history there. We've seen how before the year 1833, if you wanted to know Greenwich Mean Time, you had to go and visit the Royal Observatory Greenwich and knock on the door and ask for it. But the astronomers didn't like that. We've also seen that more and more people needed to know the time, and so there was a demand for it. And so by putting those two things together... The time started to be sold from Greenwich. You could get it from the Belleville family and then later by electricity, by telephone, or by the radio. Ruth Belleville's time came to an end in 1943 when she passed away. But what she left behind, along with all of those other inventors and providers, was a legacy of selling time from the Greenwich Observatory, which we still live with today. It's a pleasure talking to you today, but I'm going to shut up. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. So we'll have questions now. I have a first question for you. I believe that your main activity currently is to write a book about time. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, I'm writing another book. I wrote a book about Ruth Belleville. I'm now returning to time as a theme, and I'm writing a history of civilization told through 12 clocks. Each chapter tells the story of a clock from as old as two and a half thousand years ago, as modern as a 21st century clock. And I want to understand how we can learn about civilizations and societies from the clocks and timekeepers that they make. So I'm pretty excited about that. So any question from the audience? Thank you for the uh, interesting uh, subject. And um, my question is about the space time. I'm interested more in the space time, not in our time. <laughs> uh, what do you think about uh, the, like the space time, like the movie of Interstellar? Uh, 
uh, where the people were traveling from planet to planet and this time has been fastly changed. So what's that? That's an interesting question about space-time. And of course, time changed fundamentally in the 1900s when Albert Einstein published his um, theories of relativity, which for the first time set a scientific basis on the fact that all time is relative. So when you start to travel in space, there are all kinds of effects which have to be considered on clocks, which don't need to be considered on Earth. Actually, that's not true. They didn't need to be considered on Earth. Um, one very quick comment on how accurate clocks are today, and I'll be talking about this in my next talk in a, in a little while. The, the, the clocks made today are incredibly accurate, atomic clocks made in physics labs around the world. Um, because of Einstein's theories of relativity, both of them affect time. General relativity, which is about gravity, means that clocks operate at different rates depending on the gravitational field they are in. Special relativity is about speed, which means that clocks moving at different speeds to each other tell different times. Both of these have to be taken into account. The clocks now made in physics labs around the world are so accurate, this is absolutely true, that if they take one of their clocks and move it onto the shelf above, they have to take into account general relativity and correct for it. If they move that clock on a trolley across a courtyard to move to a new building, they have to take into account special relativity. And I did not believe this. I'd heard this somewhere, and I've asked the scientists at the National Physical Laboratory in the UK who are making some of the best clocks, is this really true? And they said, yes, yes, absolutely. We have to take into account relativity everywhere we work. So the, so the relationship between time and space and space travel, and as space travel gets more and more um, commonplace, this will become more and more important, it's absolutely crucial. And it's at the heart of the scientific study of time. Was there any issues uh, in the 19th century for someone to make uh, a clock? Because uh, I think uh, it's really hard for a Bivol family. Why didn't they just make another clock and hang it anywhere in London so people can uh, see the time? That's, thank you for that question, which is, I think, of fundamental importance. The obvious answer to the question, how do you know the time, is that you have very good clocks wherever you need them. But even today, and that's, and that's more acceptable today when the clocks that we could afford to buy or companies could afford to buy are so much better. But still to this day, there is a hierarchy of time accuracy and precision. And every clock has to refer back up that chain to an ultimate time provider. So the answer to that question is, how would the people who operated that clock in the center of London, for instance, know what time it was? The only way at that time to find the time was to use the stars, or in other words, the rotation of the Earth. That's how time was measured. The, the Earth rotates 24 hours, once every 24 hours on its axis. And so by looking at stars above, as the same star passes over directly ahead twice, 24 hours has elapsed. So that's how time was found and then set onto the clock. The clock simply keeps time between two successive star observations. So technically, in the 19th century, it would have been possible to have a time-finding astronomical instrument, like a telescope, wherever you were, and you could take your own readings and set your clock right. But it was really hard to do that, and the smaller the telescope, the less accurate the results. And you'd need to, you need to be a really good scientist to get the right results. So actually, whilst it does seem unusual that it was so much hard work for the Bellevilles to carry the time around, actually it made a lot of sense because all of those clocks in London needed to be set. And the only way to do that was to find the time at Greenwich because that's where the astronomers were. Now, today, as I say, it's easier because we've got radio signals or whatever, but even now, all of the clocks that we have, we should know how they get their time and therefore whether we can trust them or not. But it's a really good question because it gets, it gets right to the heart of metrology and measurement science. And how do you know that the thing you're measuring is correct? And how do you get access to a better source? Really good. 
Hi. Hi. Other than fiction, are there real research about time travel? <laughs> um, sure. At, yeah, I mean, I think you'll know far better than me in a science university, but the concept of time travel at the subatomic level, at the quantum level, I mean, we're really getting outside of my knowledge zone, but yeah, at the subatomic level, time travel is significant. The question of whether that can then be scaled up to the many atoms that make humans, I think, is still the realms of fiction, but I understand that there is significant research on understanding the quantum effects of subatomic particles, and I hope that somebody in the room who knows more than me will either keep quiet if I've just got that wrong, or can pitch in with some more, but um, I think it will grow in importance, yes. Um, my question is, how were modern day time zones decided on, and how accurate are they? Another wonderful question, how were modern day time zones decided on? Um, I uh, br briefly touched on the time zone system, and I probably could have made out that it was all very simple. There are 24 hours in the globe, so each one is a one hour time zone, so they're all nice and neat, you just divide the globe into 24 zones. But as soon as you look at a, at a map, a time zone map, you'll see that the edges of the time zones are very jagged edged. There are all kinds of things come into play, and the reason why that question is such a good one is because it brings in kind of political aspects of time, and it brings in nations, because first of all, the countries on Earth don't follow the neat one-hour um, time zones, and if you're, if you're a country, you may well want all of your people to be on the same time. It's, it's unhelpful to have time zone changes within certainly smaller countries. Even many large countries like China have a single time zone, even though they cover maybe four or five hours. Um, the, the short answer, because I should give short answers, I've been told this, the short answer to your question is any country or, um, or state is, is, can choose whatever time it wants to keep. There is no law which tells any country what time they keep, nor where the boundaries are. So it comes down to conventions and it comes down to either ease of use, you might want to be in the same time zone as your major trading partners, so, for instance, most of the European Union is on Central European time, inclu um, including many which are actually quite a long way outside of that by the sun. It makes sense for the EU to have a common time for trading purposes. Or you might even want to change your time zone to make a political statement about who your allies are. And um, places um, such as Venezuela have fairly recently changed their time zones by maybe half an hour or quarter of an hour to make a comment that they're moving an alliance to a different block, if you like. Um, so, the, so, the, so the very interesting um, case of time zones is they can tell us so much about politics and about the history of uh, politics. What it means, of course, is that it's very hard to find the time because you need the very latest time zone maps, and believe me, they change every year. Um, before the internet made it easy to Google what time is it in, in Jeddah, uh, before that, the best advice I was ever given was if you want to know the time in any country that you, you might be visiting is you just telephone the international hotel in that um, capital city because they'll answer the phone 24 hours a day. In my case, you know, for, helpfully for me, they'll probably speak English uh, and they'll know the time where they are. The question, what time is it, is not a straightforward one to answer, and it, it really hasn't been in the past. Thank you very much. So if you would like to continue this conversation, David will give a second talk at 2 in the Spine Auditorium between 2 and 3. So thank you for your time and this wonderful presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.